Welcome to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. Join us as we share our favorite RPGs, one-shot games, tabletop games, reviews, and convention panels. Sit back and enjoy the show. Hi, this is Kelly, a.k.a. Trixie from Ragnarok and Roll, a sign to Ragnarok story, and Tilda Wimblewick from D&D Journey of the Fifth Edition. First off, I would just like to say thank you to everyone for listening to our varied adventures, as well as for rating us on iTunes and RPGpodcast.com. If you haven't rated us yet, we would greatly appreciate it if you could. And if you're looking for more ways to support our efforts, we are now on Patreon, a great site where you can help us continue making more podcasts, as well as some special surprises for our patrons. If you can, please look us up at www.patreon.com slash cppn. Every little bit helps. And again, thank you for listening. Well, welcome one and all. I think we can get started. Yeah. It's, what time? It's, it's one, two. one or two, it's so it's two time. Five, five. Welcome one and all. Uh, I'm the Grand Arbiter. <laughs> I'm Gail Carragher. And I'm Madame Askew. We, we can't see you. We can't see you. We see you hiding, skulking back there. We'd like to welcome you to Strength of Heart, Finding the Romantic Hero That's Right for You. <laughs> so, Madam Askew and I had this sort of wild conversation about what kinds of panels do we want to bring, and we were like, see. We must lean into the theme, and Madness, you and I love love, right? Madness, yes, we do. The love theme is heroes and villains, villains everybody. Right. You didn't know yeah. what was going you on. You're unaware convention. of the, the, the thing you signed up for. The theme <laughs> is heroes and villains, and and today we're talking about um, romantic heroes, which are delightful in every respect. And we have. Can you just hand her this? We have to see. Okay. I don't actually feel like I'm looking that hard for the space, but thank you. Thank you. So, we heard a rumor that the uh, magnificent creature, our favorite author beast, Gail Carragher, was also going to be here. And we're like, ooh! Gail knows something about romantic heroes. I wonder if we could prevail upon her to join the panel and give us credibility. And, and, uh, and uh, academic gravitas and uh, all of the magic that Gail brings. So really pretend like she likes us. Yeah, happy to do all of this performative activity. Yes, I will pretend you. like I'm an academic. I will pretend that all of it will be pretend. <laughs> so, welcome to the panel, and uh, thank you all for being here. It's Friday, it's early in the day, and we're so happy to see you. Shall we get started? Yeah. Let's do it. We're just going to trade. We're just going to, it's going to be mic shuffle until we've gotten to the point where we're done with that part of the conversation. It's fine. So we have we have four archetypes that we sort of identified. Manoscu and I were were out in the in the laboratory doing research. They did preliminary research for a panel, which uh, I've been in this game for 15 years. I, I don't think I've ever done that. Um, but okay. <laughs> I heard you were an academic and we wanted to, you know, meet your masterful goal. So I like organization and I don't like a meeting that doesn't have an agenda. And uh, Madame Askew has a deep, um, a deep guttural need to get an A plus in things that you can't get grades on. Mm-hmm. It's true. Telling all the time. Yes, telling all the tales. So we've chosen, we've identified what we would describe as the four or five primary 
the hero archetypes that we're going to focus on today. The five romantic hero archetypes we're focusing on today are the tortured hero, the servant hero, the himbo hero, the <laughs> sensitive hero, and the confident hero. Yes, so there are five different kinds of heroes that we're going to focus on. Um, the first one we're going to focus on is, of course, um, uh, the tortured hero, also known as the Byronic hero. Uh, the tortured hero, it has, if you're out and about and you're like, I'm in the need of a romantic lead in my life, here are the benefits and downsides to choosing to partner up with the tortured hero. Grab Darbiter before you dive all the way in to that. I just want to preface that by hero, we do not mean that this person is only a, a masculine person. Hero is an all-encompassing romantic partner of any and every gender, just to put that clarification out there. Can we, do we have a third mic on the way? Oh, I have it here. Yes, it, we're having hot problems with that one. Yes. Okay. Which one's, which one's having a problem? The one that you are currently holding. Channel six, yes. All right. Okay. Well, it sounds like it's working now. Check. Okay. Great. Yeah. Then I did. I did fix it. Okay. Woo! Thank you, Ray. Thank you. A uh, round of applause for Ray, everybody. Yay! Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Patty, for for facilitating the Ray. And being amazing, and talented, and smart, and pretty. Still on? Yeah, there we are. Yeah. Now we can talk over each other like normal. Yes, <laughs> ideal, ideal outcomes. So, yes, a hero, in this particular context we are describing, a, a gender is less relevant. However, there is a, there's interesting, when we get down to the, some of the other sections, there's some interesting gender dynamics in section three that I'm excited about. That himbo. Yes. Yeah. There's a real interesting gender dimension. Sure is, yeah. So, the tortured hero has, we decided, some solid qualities. These qualities are the good qualities, the qualities you look for that are attractive. They've got hidden depths. They have places to grow. They're nothing but depth. Yes. <laughs> um, like the, the depth of my two minds. They have the biggest possible turnaround of all the heroes of like going from uh, difficult to like, it's, it's a bigger peak. Character growth arc. Growth arc is high. It's Everest. <laughs> um, and then, um, <clears throat> although they often default. And this, the tragic. last note says, um, um, more mm, uh, darker, it gets your dark fantasy type yes. stuff, rougher experiences. Spicy. Spicier. More chili peppers. Very I'm spicy. Old. Very spicy. I would say also from a purely, like, I would, I would talk seriously from, they're going to be comedy and I can be serious. Uh, I would talk seriously from like a writerly perspective. Which is they're also meaty to write. Yeah, and, and they are without question the most popular. Yeah, to write. I mean, yeah. it's it's really easy to see why they're so popular because the 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 the, the Everest that that mountain. That you also, have to they go can up. they can be two complete assholes and then get redeemed. Yes, and uh, readers love that and writers like it because it's a lot more to get our teeth into. So we like it. We like a Byronic hero, uh, still, for 200, 300 years. This, this, this archetype has been around, and we, we're still big fans. The so cultures. here are what we would describe as our downsides. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you are. Oh, I hate Byronic heroes. I don't write them. Yeah, so we're tortured hero and Byronic hero are related but not the same. It's it's one of the reasons I, I've never uh, had wild success in the romance 
industry in terms of reader bases. Most of my readers come out of science fiction and fantasy and still do, even though I write romance, and it's because I avoid the Byronic era in particular. I just, it's too dark. I don't, I don't like the, the dark. So, I love the darkness. So we have a list. I made a list of examples. I'll give you one immediately, which is Wolverine. Yeah, Wolverine is a real um, is a true Byronic hero. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. And his and the fact that and the big important part is he's also unsuccessful in his romantic yeah, endeavors, which is like key to the Byronic experience, yeah. at least. Heathcliff is the classic. Yeah, so the, the R, R5, we picked five examples. Um, so Kylo Ren is a very like traditional tortured hero. Very popular uh, right now, especially on the TikToks. The, <laughs> the positive qualities are not always the thing that really define these kinds of romantic leads. The negatives are almost always more relevant. Anakin, Anakin Skywalker is a less, still exactly the same archetype. Yeah, so you've got the qualities that makes them sort of bad is that they don't fix themselves. They generally need like a motivation to fix themselves. Externally activated. They are wallowing in their trauma, just live in there, like in a swamp of sadness. Um, they make excuses, which is a really important component that I think is very interesting in those spaces where it's a lot of like, oh, but I can't because of my father, my dark past, dark past. Yes, my exactly. dark past, whatever. Exactly. Exactly. And they can, in some instances, lack empathy for other people. Almost always, yeah. actually. They're pretty self-involved. Um, so our examples are Kylo Ren, Heathcliff, Catra from, uh, uh, Shira, uh, Bo from Lost Girl, and in some places Edward from Twilight are all examples of tortured heroes. If you're a big fan of military sci-fi, a military a romance, a suspense romance in particular, there are a lot of Byronic heroes who get saved, usually by sex with the right person. Uh, which is, in see. heterosexual romances, I call this pussy salvation. I yes, have a question. My yes, Eve Ryan. From my uh, romance advice giver, Madame Askew, yes. how would you suggest going around seducing a Byronic hero? Oh, this is an excellent question. So when I'm not luring them to the shoals of my personality, I do try and... Uh, Woo them out of the wakes of their despair with my ankles. <laughs> so I tend to go to the shore because Byronic heroes like to read poetry by the shore. Um, usually it's their own and usually it's bad. Uh, and so if I and just. It's not even a good beach, it's one with lots of rocks. Yes. So I just swan about and I'm like, ooh, Cooey, I have an ankle. And they're like, oh. I must make an ode to your egg. I'm like, all right, do you have 500 a year? Or what's the situation? Do you have an inheritance? Oh, no, you're impoverished. Oh. Uh, I got to say, uh, again, this is going to be fun for everybody, including me. Uh, but Madame Askew has demonstrated the classic archetypal pairing with a Byronic hero, which is a sunshine cinnamon roll. Um, often the chaotic sunshines in particular are very popular. So the, the, the himbo it, uh, or the herbo or the vebo is a very good Dembo. pairing. A thembo? Thembo. is very good. Uh, excellent. A thembo is a very good pairing um, because the Byronic hero would like to tragically swat about and try to save um, such, such uh little tortured creatures who are at the whims of a very dark and doomy world, which the Byronic hero sees, but of course the sunshine does not see. Oh, the um, rainbows! Yes, yes. <laughs> and, um, it, it, it's definitely like you really need a damsel-type character. You do. You need someone who needs to be rescued to motivate them to improve themselves to then do yes, the thing. The protective instinct is the, the only really strong instinct that Byronic Hero has that can so be they need a dog. They are a dog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a rescued who 
Oh, you can I can ask you the little kitten. Yeah. Meow, meow. <laughs> a competent, a competent counterpart is 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 the is going to end in tragedy probably. Like yeah. especially if the competent counterpart ends up saving themselves. <laughs> the ironic here is like that. I'm I'm no good here. I must throw myself into the I ocean. Mean, that's like despair. To get us to like look at it, that's like one of the biggest challenges with the. This is really telling my media consumption. Go for it. The Bella Edward dynamic is really challenged by this because yes. Bella isn't exactly a damsel. She's also a Byronic She's hero. Also it's Byron. two Byrons. It's Byron and Byron are making out. So the sex is great, but like, oh my god. this Whoa. That is the most, like, I don't know, lackluster, boring relationship oh, ever. Because they're just going to dwell together. Like, just, who I wants mean, to be in the room with those people? They wallow oh, in their immortality. <laughs> wallow. Um, Madison, you, we're not generally big fans of this particular archetype for ourselves. I mean, I grew out of that phase. I I graduated from being 16 into being like, an adult. You know who's a fan of this archetype? Teenagers, 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 are teenagers. Are they really love Byron. They love it. I also yeah. think there's something really valuable that the the Byronic female lead has a, some dynamic dynamicism that is not possible with Byronic male leads, which I think is really interesting. Um, there's a whole sort of like the way in which queerness can sort of intersect with that Byronic, like sort of tortured elements. There are a lot of Byronic queers. Yeah. Let's be real, because like a Byronic hero always has daddy issues or mommy issues or, or whatever. Um, a sad backstory. Yes. Kicked out of their home. As this you. is this is awfully familiar. <laughs> this is an awfully familiar story. Um, I, I, in answer to your question, which of mine are Byronic? The only one I can think of off the top of my head, you have to remember I have over 30 books and I forget all my characters. Um, <laughs> is Felix. And and Felix is wildly popular as a, as a secondary lead. A lot of people suffer from secondary lead syndrome with him because it's in my YA series. So obviously we're all gonna love the dark, tortured rich boy who has very big daddy problems. Um, and I wrote him from the get-go as I was poking fun at the love triangle in that book because it's clear that's the worst possible outcome for Sophronia is Felix, like always was. But that's because I'm poking fun at that Byronic hero with him and I didn't even realize I was doing it. He's, he is so perfect in that role because it's a wonderful- Even wears eye makeup. Yeah, yeah, but it's also like a very wonderful lampooning of that experience. What, what about Channing, Channing, Channing? Our uh, Channing. Oh, he does have a really tortured back. I like, originally I wrote him just as a plain old asshole. Like, and then I was like, well, it's going to be really fun to try to redeem an oh, asshole. You redeemed him pretty well. Thank you. <laughs> but I did have to give him a tragic backstory, right? Like, in order to explain how big of an asshole he is, he has to have some real baggage, <laughs> which is a very Byronic solution to the problem. But I don't know that I would necessarily call him a villain. Maybe he's just a little bit tortured. Not, not tortured, but sensitive under his mm. presence. I mean, yeah. It's, one thing that we will say, and that John Mattis and I discussed at length, is that there's a lot of crossover for all of these like categories because it's really a bunch of traits and like uh, not memes, but not the the literary memes. Tropes. I was like the word I was looking for is like meme, but for but for book. <laughs> um, well, this yes. one edges into an extremely popular trope at the moment, which I call outsourced moral compass, which is when oh, you have, love that I love this shit so much, which is where you have a literal psychopath, like somebody who does not fit into a dominant culture or the culture that you're writing within or that the conceits of the genre is presenting. And they kind of realize it. They're usually, you know, brilliant psychopath types. And so they have to find another character who will tell right from wrong for them and usually then sick them at it at the wrong in an assassin kind of way. 
because they realize that if they're left on their own, they will simply just kill everything indiscriminately. So th their one moment... Weaponize your boyfriend. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> your one moment of power or clarity is that. It's very popular. This is all ties to like the who hurt you trope, which is the funniest moment on TikTok at the moment. But um, yeah, and it, it, it means that they care, but they only care about one person in all of humanity. This is very juicy to write, too, because if you decide to kill that one person, <gasps> oh. <laughs> then your psychopath can go entirely psychopathic, but the readers are on their side, and so you can have real doom and destruction, uh, which is, again, what they tried to do, I think, with um, Darth Vader, but did not succeed at the doing. Yeah, I think, I think that that's actually one of the biggest challenges for Star Trek Star Wars as a as a mode is that they don't make their villains. They try really hard to sympathize their, their villains, but the the villains' behavior is so like it's too much. it's too much, and it's not informed by their like Anakin as a character is really frustrating for lots of people, me included. Because of his, he says he loves Padme so much, but it doesn't reflect in his behaviors or thinks about what Padme might think about any behavior or I choices. Mean, they could have tried gynecology, but I know they have starships and they fly through the space, so gynecology is just too complicated for them. <laughs> How hard. Yeah, but Poor Anakin. I think that that's like the problem is like that there's this big component of the writing is sexist in ways that make it difficult for those characters to be redeemed in the way that the book into the the narrative is intending them to. So whilst we are dressed as Starfleet <laughs> characters, I think that we are criticizing Star. We are talking, <laughs> talking morality <laughs> but, of the galaxy. Oh, I'm, I'm so happy that you're you're ready to move along. I am always true. ready to leave behind Byron. Yeah, it's not our fave, so we're going to move on. We're going to move on to one of Madness Q's favorite. Oh, here we go. It's not her favorite favorite, but it is likely the one that she is. So, oh, oh here we go. So this is the servant or supportive hero. I love a servant. They're the, the kind of like always taking care of you type heroes. Uh, they're selfless or self-sacrificing. They tend to be reliable and they let the main character take the lead. So the examples that we have on the list are Samwise Gamgee mm -hmm. with the implied, implied homosexuality there. Um, Superman, uh, Wesley, from the Princess Bride, mm -hmm. um, Gabrielle um, Maylin from Shadow and Bone, and Peta from uh, from oh, Hunger Games. Oh, Games. Very good polls. Yeah, you were that last one. I thought of it just now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, good very call. good calls. Yeah. So uh, oh, the bad, the negative things are going to be like passive passivity is a big problem. They don't want to take actions on their own. They have to be told what to they do. Have to be told what to do. Um, they have secret expectations of you that they don't tell you. Like they have thoughts and dreams and fantasies about things that they're not going to express to you. Um, they have places their love interests on a pedestal, which is wrapped with problems. And their personal growth is really inhibited by their love interest existence. They tend to remain flatline as characters. Yes. Yeah, you're right. They, yeah. Is that facts? Yes. A fact. It seems like these people are just shattering the Yeah. I mean, yes. That's very sexy. Very, very, very attractive to some people. And I think it's also important to remember that this is like a very normal experience. Like, the whole trope of like, well, we grew up together is merit in this particular space. Sure. It's the whole, like... Asian dramas love this oh, one. Oh, they love this 
It, I would call it China's favorite hero, quite frankly. And, and the sea drum verse. And I don't, I can't even name a sea drama where there hasn't been the, the dude character. Well, I do think the other fun thing about this is that uh, if you pair a servant hero with a Byronic hero, it's very bad times for that servant hero. Sure <laughs> 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 Another way to look at this is as, as is Karen Dom is another kind of component of this. Yeah, the, I I think that this can like leak into other ones. Like the more competent uh, servant heroes are going to be like your uh, sort of like your. What am I thinking of? Um, well, Lyle is a is a Lyle's a really good example, character. but I was also thinking of Madame uh, LeFou. Oh yeah, because Madame LeFou, like, while she is not getting the romantic component, she is doing all the work. She is slightly psychopathic, though. Yes, right. Like <laughs> she's a little bit like you don't know where if she has. The, the, I cause I think about hearing heroes as having a solid moral foundation. I wouldn't call her that, but. Yeah. It's often betas, yeah. For in me, like I think of them as sort of beta personality types because I think of more world dynamics, but yeah. I think it's, this is probably one of my favorites to write, I gotta say. I, I would say that's one of these in every single one of my books. I would also say that like there are the sensitive, the, so I was wondering if you would consider Spock from Star Trek. Oh, you certainly could, yeah. A category, because I mean, but I would say Spock is probably going to fall under competence. I think he is a competent hero. He is competent. Yeah. It's important. That we will get to it. I promise. But there's a lot of components to Spock that make him a competent hero. The most important one being his obliviousness. To romantic attention, yeah, which is like really important to the competent hero's substructure, and it's very hard for me. He's he's he is a caretaker in that regard, and there's lots of caretaking as part of the competent hero's construction, but he's doing it as a noble and moral duty he has to literally everyone and everything in his life, where the support servant hero, it's only their person that they're going to be wanting to do this kind of sacrifice for. Or their family network. Yeah, yeah. they're like, they have to be close. They don't have the same, it's they, they have to have the group dynamic for that person to legitimately work. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we're, we're giving you a space. Oh, good. I was like, I'm like, yes, that's all right. Uh, sorry. Um, so any, more, any more questions or interests or comments on, on our interpretations of servant heroes? Because we're going to move into, in the, into the, I would say, kind of the fun one. Oh, oh, I, God, I, love this I one. actually, I have a question. Because you gave examples, Randolph, and they're very good examples. And we worked on them together. So I'm like on board. We were sitting on the Zoom call. We did, we yeah, zoomed and everything. But Gail, my darling, my yes. dad, my delight. Yes. Who's one of your favorite, uh, you know, servant heroes? This is the thing is, I mean, you named really, really good ones, uh, but I struggle to identify them in, in pop culture often. Mm -hmm. But they are often side characters. So I'm a K-drama consumer, and I think in a lot of K-dramas, second lead is often the caring, and rather than because K-dramas uh, dabble in the other the other tropes for heroes more than China does. But um, but yeah, there's a sort of uh, a nobility to the care to the caretaker character that I really enjoy personally. Um, I think I like to collect these in life, this personality type. <laughs> Shocking. Um, so uh, so I'm very, very sort of attracted to them on, on all levels as characters. So they people my universe. 
um, partly because I think they tend, as people, people who have this facet of their personality actually make the world go round, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, like, y yes. They're the function of the earth. Right? is important. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so they're, to me, they're very special. Um, yeah. So my favorites is this particular genre, like, and I don't say this very often, are probably the ones I write. They're my favorites. They are <laughs> my own tasty. character. They're very juicy, and I like them. Yeah, and I would call um, Fex, for whoever yeah, asked, a uh, caring. Oh, Fex falls into this category so hard. It's, yeah. It's, he was like built in the category. Do but you the, need noodles? Do you need a hot drink? <laughs> Can I get my ladle and get you some food? But oh, the thanks. but his problem, of course, is that he's recruited to the cause, so to speak, as a competency. Um. So and so his growth arc as a character through through three books is shaking off competency for caring and realizing that that's actually his strength. Because when he initially enters, he thinks his strength is competency, um, but he is caring, and he thinks that as, of that as a weakness because of his Byronic background. So <laughs> a little mix of everything, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> He's a complex character. Um, would you like to move on? Yes. Let's let's dive into our favorite little juicy nugget. I mean, coming up. this one is some interesting ones. But this is one. Good. This is the one that actually we had the most debates about. Oh, I'm ready. So the next one is the himbo hero. The himbo hero is enthusiastic, unburdened by shame, uncomplicated, and uh, my last bullet is hot. <laughs> also, often a slut. Yes. yes. Uh, I also watch a lot of BL, and that's why I say uncom uh, un unburdened by shame. Yeah, the 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 uh, bisexual slut himbo is an absolute archetype at this juncture. Like, no, I like to invite them to tea. There's some <laughs> regularly. There's some downsides. They're low risk but low depth. They can be real shallow folk, which is okay. <laughs> Um, they're flighty, oblivious in a oblivious of like risk and of like the responsibilities and responsibilities of others, and uh, they tend to be, in many cases for readers, a fantasy fulfillment of a certain kind. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they're like so unrealistic in their existence. It's so like there's lots of ways in which they're like. The, the DNA for Manic, manic Pixie Dream Girl yeah. lives in this. So, so, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, our examples are Finn the Human, which I thought was a cute one, um, Bing Lee from Pride and Prejudice and Mad Muscues, Jason from The Good Place, Scorpia from uh, she, -Ra. she -Ra, and uh, Thor the Avenger from Marvel. Um, one of the interesting things that we discussed was a distinction between himbo, shibo, devo, and bimbo. Because bimbo and shibo are not the uh, are not, not the same. same. They are fundamentally different. Um, and important, they they share. Some DNA in the, the in that all of the bows do, but they are not the same. We had to have a conversation where Madness he was like, "Oh, who was it that you suggested?" Uh, I suggested the House Bunny from the House Bunny. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. I was yeah. like, "Oh, she is a delightful himbo." <laughs> and my thoughts were, "That's not a himbo. That's a bimbo, and that's not a problem." That's just a different thing. And there is a weird sort of gendered thing going on here with gender because there are certain kinds of behaviors that are like himbo behaviors regardless of like, like there's like... Regardless of gender. Regardless of gender. Like there are ways in which the way that Scorpia interacts 
But the world is very similar to the way that like some of these other characters do. And the gender is less relevant. From a writerly perspective, almost always if you're if you're not if you're not going purely superficial comedy, if you're writing for, you know, character evolution and depth, this character almost always masks pain. But they're usually performatively silly. Um, I mean, you can, I get, like, this is really funny because uh, I now realize that we're talking about all these different heroes and I stuck them all in Texas Pantheon. It's like, oh, well, okay. I mean, yes. like Miss It, right, and, and Beryl. Miss It and Beryl are. But Mer Miss It is very performatively flighty, right? It, like, he, he's, he's using it as a weapon. He's, he's weaponized his, right? His, uh, his fragile and vibrating. Exactly. You need to make yourself you, but Beryl is just genuinely this. Yes. Like, Beryl is genuinely loving and she probably does have depth. We never got to it in the course of the books but she's genuinely oh, just She has depth. She has a deep deep respect for her people and wants yes. to do honor by them. And wants to do the best that she can. She's very earnest. She's very earnest. I mean, both can be very earnest. It's very endearing to I write. I think that that's, that's part of the attraction of what that character, like. But Lord Uncle Doman is also a hero. Oh, he's the. But hero. that is, that is completely weaponized Hinduism, right? Yeah, like, it's, 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 it's a, it's a weapons grade. Yeah, weapons great yeah. in both. <laughs> also, he it, knows what he's doing. I would argue that it's his one of his greatest strengths in the character, but also one of his greatest weaknesses. Oh yeah, because he never can he can never get over it. He is it's, it's the protection that he, he has. and he can't let go. Like never. It's it's his his whole it's because I do think there's like earnest himbos. <laughs> Seem familiar to you in any way? Oh no, because I, because just so we're clear, I am, I am not this archetype in that regard. You may think I'm not the archetype. I am not this archetype. I'm a slightly too self-aware and too uh, willing to drop down barriers for this archetype. <laughs> yeah, it, that's the thing with the himbo characters. They're the hardest. To break and to evolve because the audience likes the himboism so much, because it's so funny and comedic and light and bright, that if you reveal the core, you take that away from your readers or your watchers, and they're going to start to dislike that character as a result. So. It's also sort of why you're not, like, you're a fan of the trope. But you're not necessarily like that's not what you look for when you're like I want to read about a man, man, woman, or person that I find attractive. Madness, you. You're not like that into this particular trope. Oh well, I'm not gonna wed a himbo. I'm not gonna make a lifetime with a himbo. I might have a stable of himbos <laughs> that I visit. Me. I'll be like this Monday. It must be. You know who might fall into this category as well is Bingley from Pride and Prejudice. Totally Bingley. Yeah. Oh, Bingley is such a himbo. Yeah. Because he's, he's on like, the list. He's a golden retriever. <laughs> yeah. Prancing through that book. Yes, and that's he's, so, he's like so oblivious. To but all honest the imagination. They would make very good partners. <laughs> like I kind of like a himbo. It's like I mean, there's much I, less work. I, well, I, I think I, I think that if hippos were more real, I think that would be the case. <laughs> but I think it's true. The not. problem is, is that, like, as a, as an archetype uh, of the archetypes, I see all of these kinds of things in the world. The hippo as an archetype goes sour like that in real life. Because yeah. exposure to, there is nothing attractive about a person in your real life who cannot be serious about your feelings, about what's going on around you.
and you speak for yourself. <laughs> I, I do think that the lovely thing about Bingley, who is like a quintessential himbo, like literary, Jane Austen, bring it home, uh, is that he knows when to be like, no, no, dear, dear, it's going to be all right. I am aware that this is We bad. have money. <laughs> we have money. <laughs> we'll be fine. That's so delightful, actually. I, I love a Bingley as a himbo. He's like, and I have estates and servants, and it'll be fine. Don't you worry. I think the real problem is that a lot of the himbos that we know in our lives, they don't really have money. That's really the problem. They're impoverished himbos. They're <laughs> waiting for their moment. Because I, I question, like, I do also think that there's also the performance element is really indicative to our real life. Like, all of those folks on the internet who are doing, like, Instagram model type himbo behavior, that is all so cultivated as a brand and not, like, as a real so it's harder for me to sort of be like, is this even who you really are? Or is this just a brand you're trying to sell? Isn't that the way with all the heroes and all yeah, the dancers? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think the Byronic ones lead, I think they all lead into that. What I would say is that the hippo is more prevalent in, not in popular culture, but in our real lives as a trope of people selling themselves on the market. People yeah. make stories about their lives as Byronic heroes, but you're not gonna see those folks like at the at the same quantity. So we get a, a slight version of this in romance in particular, which is the rake version. Um, and the way you solve for this in a writer capacity is through redemption or reformation. So you save the hippo from his own himboism, you save the rake from his own slutty ways, you know, morality, yada yadas. But um, yeah, that that is- Get a ring on his finger. You stick them on, or, or give them a child, which is the, that, you know, like give them an, a, like a core network to family. Um, and unfortunately, this is also prevalent in real life. One of the conversations I've had over the years with my male author friends, dude male author friends, has been uh, them coming into feminism, but not until they have a daughter. And you're Yikes. like, oh, you had to, like, you didn't have a wife, a sister, or a mother, or anything else before that? Well, uh, it took your it took your spoo fertilizing an egg for you to, like, realize that was, <laughs> like, Anyway, um, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, don't apologize, you're not perfect. <laughs> uh, which is just to say that the, 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 the like classically, the Ray Kimbo kind of can be redeemed with a, a child, which represents him furthering his own network into domesticity. And anchoring, right? That's the and, anchoring. Yeah. yeah, because they are liberty gibberists, mm -hmm. uh, which is fun to write. But, but it needs to be pulled in. Gail, do you have a favorite him uh, or one of, because you, you like a him. I love a him. Uh, they're really fun to write. I'm a comedy author, right? So uh, uh, they're fun. Uh, hold on, I have to think. Um, I'm, you know, I'm thinking mostly in terms of like K-drama and Hippo characters. Uh, there's a, a ridiculous but popular manhwa based show called True Beauty, which is a makeover arc. And uh, basically the second lead, and this is one of those that I have terrible second lead syndrome. The second lead is a total like bad boy himbo and it's Too wonderful. Tasty. He's Too <laughs> great. It's a great <laughs> character. Um, yeah, so that'd be one of my pull. Do you think that, so here is a, the question that I've been thinking about is do you think that because like do you think that part of the reason that there's such challenges for um for the not just because they're split but the do you think well i mean oh sorry i'm gonna say something really yeah well, you get i my thoughts left the building uh, i think 
I would call Dimity a himbo as well. Um, I do use a best friend, him Ivy. Like, I, I, it's like the yeah. ultimate, right? I think that one of the best, I'm, just because I'm currently there, um, I literally closed the book on that page this week. Um, I think that's actually one of the strongest parts of book four, um, the Parasol Protectorate, is Ivy getting her flowers for her actual talents and skills. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, that yeah. is the, one of the best parts. But that's of my board. favorite thing to do with a himbo, is set them up for a really long period of time. Uh, I did this with Agatha, too, where, like, actually, they're competent. They just don't feel the need to prove that to anybody. They just, they're just, like, quietly competent with a layer of uh, jocularity over it. And, you know, like... That's their best. They're ever. competent, but they're not. They're not. They don't care that much about it. They're competent. They rather have fun. fun. Exactly. They don't have fun. <laughs> exactly. They're competent, but they're not out in the Prussian tea dueling camps, crawling through the mud to get yeah. the biscuit. They're like, I don't have to be that tough. I could just like, you know, bake you some biscuits. That'd be fine, right? We can have a good time. <laughs> this is why Dimity's book is one of my favorite novellas that I got to write because where she, you know, goes into a vampire hive and redecorates it, and that it saves the hive through redecoration. Um, but it's you know, a fantastic. It's a, book. I it's love a, that it's one. It's really fun, it's so but good. it's fun because she's just like yes, peril, but also throw cushions, um, and and she and she finds herself, uh, you know, a ex ballet dancer hero who is like, who's who's confident and. Who's like, oh, okay, I'll trail after this person and make sure the chaos is mo modulated. Yes. So, um, do you have a question? Yeah, so you have Thor on your list. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. I'm such not a... seeing it. Okay, so. Oh, but he's it's... so. So. He's hot. I mean, so hot he's super hot. That's what he is. He's, he's hot. Deeply. So arguably deeply shallow, deeply shallow, and oblivious to the world around him. Arguably, that's why his relationship with um, what's her name, Jane, Jane fails, is his obliviousness reality. to reality and his responsibilities to her. And that's 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 himbo. It's, a, it's very clever but because he's a god. His story arc. Because there's also the loss of his family, of his oh, yes. world. Oh, yes. of, yeah, those are all I mean, like those are all relevant components. But when we're talking about this specific component, we're also talking about that he like even from his initial initial entry, his relationship with Jane is one of there's a weird power dynamic. Where he is not only a god, not only is he incredibly powerful, but he doesn't always trust Jane's intelligence or knowledge of the world he's part of, which is sort of why the problems in, in Dark World happen is because of his failure to understand how much she actually knows and sort of not recognizing her strength. I mean, that's why in uh, about the gods, he has such a challenge with her because he can't imagine her as as confident, strong, and powerful. And like, that's not because he's sexist explicitly. It's because he's fully unaware of her as a person. He's a capricious god, right? Yeah. He's like an ancient Greek god where you know it's Zeus running around hugging people. Uh, but slightly modulated for the palette of the modern age. The, the, but the, the, I think the thing you're getting at is that from a writer perspective, the thing you have to do to a himbo if they don't have a core background of tragedy. You must break them. Is you have to break them. Yeah, you have to, you have to shatter their illusions of life, right? Um, and, you know, that's, so that's, that's the meme on the internet is torture the cinnamon roll, but that's really what we're getting at here, is grounding the himbo. We have another question. Would Tristan be considered in that category? 
Tristan. 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 Oh, the in in the fifth gender. Yes. Um, oh. Yeah, of course. The, it, the yeah. reveal is the tortured backstory for it, right? That that he is exiled from his planet. You kind of know that he's exiled. Um, he is genuinely enthusiastic about the new culture he's he's been absorbed into because it's the one that has decided that he feels has accepted him. Um, but that's because they don't understand him because the old, an entire world that understood him rejected him, right? But you also learn that, you know, give me on, on a six-year-old book, everybody. But um, you also learn through the course of the narrative that he, he in a way, chose that. He, like, that was his, he chose exile. So, which is tragic, but also... Yeah, so, but he, but he, like Dimity, for me, when I write these characters, I like the himboism. I like their cheerful, sup, like, superficial, but, like, sort of genuinely, genuine enthusiasm for life. And so I don't tend to break them. <laughs> so well, I, I pair them up with somebody who can facilitate them still keeping, to a certain extent, their illusions about the pleasantness of reality. Um, and that's why I hand them Crispian or I hand them Dre, because those are the kinds of personalities that can care for them and make sure they you know, aren't shattered. But I, but I write romantic comedies, so I get to do that. I don't have to break them. And they're gonna have a happy ending, which is the best. Right, with, with the Marvel Universe, that's not guaranteed. Yeah, well, not even not guaranteed is not possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, happy endings, not possible if your narrative goes on forever. Like, eventually, something bad will happen to you. You can't... Or your partner. Or, or your, your partner. partner. Like, there's yeah. just no way for that to happen. And so that's, like, he's tortured, but he's not tortured in the same, like a tortured hero requires a certain level of self-blame around it, that like he blames himself a little bit, but not in the kind of ways where he, like he takes bad behavior and has, makes these bad decisions, but they're also, I wouldn't say that his core element is ironic in any kind of way, or any torture in that no. way. It's not his, his motivation, he still t thinks he's too great, right? He's he flatlined his... likes himself so much. That I'm a little matter. surprised they haven't killed him, actually. Like, he's flatlined in such a way that from a writer's room perspective, I would have killed his character by now, because he's boring. Uh, which brings us to kind of the flaw, consequences, whatever, of writing in an unfettered universe like Marvel or similar from a purely writer's room perspective. Um, no matter what you do because of this, because your character arcs have, like characters have gone through their arcs already, you're dealing with, you're still dealing with standard tropes and archetypes, it turns into a soap opera. It will always turn into a soap opera, which means it's, it's, be, it's become serialized. So all of you out there who are very invested in the Marvel Universe understand that it will never have a satisfying ending. It is because it's too much of a cash cow, so what you're watching now is Days of Our Marvel Lives, everybody. <laughs> Just with villains and big explosive powers. How the Tesseract turns. <laughs> exactly. Um, yes. So we're going to move into the fourth category if you're ready. I'm so ready because okay. whilst I love a himbo, boy howdy, we're, we're getting close to my favorite. <laughs> okay, so next is the sensitive hero. The sensitive hero is a oh, slightly different character than the servant or suffering character. Basically, a sensitive hero is emotionally vulnerable understands your pain, they're heavily empathetic. Um, they have a desire to make things better for Earth others because they couldn't save themselves, and they have deep, deep, deep humility. So uh, this is the downsides of these ones are, of course, they're martyrs, they have low self-esteem, they can be self-destructive, both physically and emotionally, and they can't heal themselves. They still can't heal themselves. And they make bad choices. They make 
bad choices. Yeah, bad choices. <laughs> so, and the, the, so it's media, you're right, because they make terrible choices. And so, but understandably terrible choices. Give me some examples. So the examples that we have on this list, and these are some great ones in my opinion. Um, so it's Dora from uh, She-Ra. We may have a little bit of a She-Ra problem, there's just a, it's lot not of, a, problem. a lot of good women in that show that it's are not very not a problem. Relevant. It's a win. It's yeah. an opportunity. Um, the Doctor from Doctor Who. Oh, particularly yeah. 10, but all of them can suffer from this problem. A zero fail can really fall into this one. Oh, very good. Um, Orpheus, the mythological character. <laughs> yeah. And Aragorn. We put Aragorn here. Oh, interesting choice. We chose to put Eric right here after a lot of discussion. Because I was like, he's competent. Have you seen what he can do with a sword? Because I have. <laughs> so what I think is interesting about Eric Warren is, is falling into this category. And part of what makes him fall into this category is both his, he wants to be a servant really, really badly to... Um, Arwen. Arwen. He, to the elves, really. To the elves. To all of them. All of the elves. Why choose? He definitely wants to be a servant, but he also recognizes that that's like not a thing that he's allowed to do. You wouldn't pull Faramir for this one? Because I'd pull Faramir. Oh, for this one. I would pull Faramir too, but sure, I would also argue that lots of Lord of the Rings characters fall into this one because. Well, Tolkien's very invested in noble sacrifice. He is obsessed with noble sacrifice, and also he's obsessed with one of the things that I find really one of the most important and valuable things of this of Lord of the Rings as a piece is that masculinity is defined by its softness in Lord of the Rings. The strength of the characters is defined by their ability to care for each other and the people around them. And it's something that I regularly, like when I engage with this, you read it, like, yes, Aragorn can use a sword really good, but what really he did was carry the hobbits himself up that mountain, right? Like, there was like uh, ensuring that, like, recognizing that he had to make a choice between going with when he's making that choice between going with, uh, to try to chase down Sam and Frodo, or to try to save Mary and Mary Pippin. Pippin. He makes the choice to save Mary and Pippin because he recognizes that if he, that the, he recognizes that those, they need him. And that, that is the choice that he has to make in that moment. And I think that that makes him fall, I think that Faramir definitely falls into this but I think that Faramir suffers from, he leads violence, like he leads torture really hard. And I think that Aragorn is less tortured in some ways, that he's, he's not tortured by his past, he just has to choose to wield his, he has to accept his power, is what really would have boils down to that character. And that character, it's, it, he needs, he's more likely to be a martyr. He doesn't want to be a martyr of power. He just wants to be a, he wants to make sure that the people around him are safe. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure we all know this, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, Tolkien's entire trilogy is a commentary on the class system, right? Yeah. And a justification for the role of the aristocracy and nobility. Yeah. So, all of the power players have to act like off the officers of the officers in the British use of the word officer, which means you have bought your commission, which means you are the, the moneyed versus the privates in World War One and then World War II, um, and the justification for the choices that are made by the aristocrat of British society. <laughs> That's yes. what he's doing. Yes. So all of his aristocratic characters have to behave in a way that honors the, the or the hobbits, they right? The noble. little man. They have to yeah. be noble, and they can't not be. And that's sort of, the sensitive hero falls into this sort of, deeply understands the choices that they're making, and makes them anyway. 
I'm gonna. Uh, you can fight me. I'm, I'm not gonna fight you. I'm gonna counter with the writerly perspective on this, or the film writer perspective on this, which is this is the ingenue character. It's oh. just that we are looking at it. Uh, we we tend to think of ingenue as feminine, mm -hmm. um, but this is the mas masculine ingenue uh, or, or ingenue in general. And essentially, what this can come across as, especially to a modern audience, is naivete and youth. Mm -hmm. um, so this character and this character's arc is usually better served in younger stuff, so young adult pieces, even middle grade, um, and then also uh, series that are that are being sold to uh, younger generations as well, because we jaded people tend to yeah. find the ingenue or this kind of character a little one note and a little exhausting. And coying. And, and a little playing, yeah. yeah. I mean, Adora is straddling that line. I mean, She-Ra is not necessarily like young person. It's, it's certainly good for older people too, but it was meant for a more youthful audience. And so she does sort of inhabit a bit of that they learn. They have to learn about the world in order to get over the idea that they alone can save it, right? Like that's that's going to be their growth arc most of the time. Is unfortunate bitch left with reality? They yeah. learn. They need a team. They can't do yes, it exactly. On their own. They need to go on a heroine's journey. <gasps> Moving along. Moving, Moving along. along. Good question. Um, a controversial candidate? We love controversy. Also, you can raise your hand if you have opinions or just want to talk. But we're, we're here for you. But Spike and Oh, Spike. So, oh, yeah. I think Spike. Very interesting. He has multiples. I he has say. multiples. I think he really easily falls into torch and hero town. No, that's what he wants to be. Is that what yeah. he wants to be? That's how he, well, he starts as Byronic. Yes. Right? That's how he enters, and then he gets human. Yeah. And he becomes an ingenue, because he got his he yeah. got humanity, okay. right? Like, he, he literally swaps. That's a very interesting point, because I think you're right. Like, season five or whatever it was, when he got human, yeah, he soul. suddenly became an ingenue, yeah. <laughs> and he's yeah. like feckless, well, and everyone has to take care of him, and then he becomes a tragic heroine. That's true. Oh, yeah, Spike. That's fine. Well, and he's and then he comes back on Angel, on tragic again. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and as a new character, I'm sure they gave him a complete another personality I, facelift. I mean, the real challenge with those kinds of like characters is that they like they. they uh, I think my one of my favorite tropes is the heel face turn revolving door. Um, it's the the character who keeps like I'm gonna get better. Nope, gonna get better. Nope, it just continues that circle. Listen, I'm gonna love Spike for always. Mm. He is my favorite. I do so not I'm, see the I'm heel, on board but I'm with on this you. whole premise. Um, but one of my favorite things about Spike that I think leans into this is that once upon a time before he got the bite he was like doing bad poetry in like a purple velvet frock coat and he's just like i'm a poet i want to be byron is that no you are not darling you need a well you need to you know say fancy things and throw petals you're you're just not that tragic not now yet. now i think about firefly and i think about all the different ones we've got on board that oh. ship, because Jane is our himbo, right? Like, <laughs> we're never gonna, gets redeemed, stays a himbo the whole time. So we're gonna, we're gonna, unless there's any more thoughts, we've got, we got some time. We're gonna, we want to get to. We've talked around it a lot. We're gonna get to Madam's Few's favorite, Here the we go. confident hero. <gasps> okay, so confident heroes, good quality, self-reliant, experts, passionate. Um, bad qualities, risk averse, single-minded, uh, single-minded, romantically oblivious, 
um, intimidating, and they dislike change. Oh yeah, they are entirely resistant to change. Uh, but then they find a, a very chaotic cinnamon roll, and change is their life. Yeah. So our <laughs> example, they like it or not. Our examples are Darcy, because we can't not include him. But he is not a Byronic. He is a he's a cop. He is, but what is he confident at? Big money. Rich. Big rich. Yes. Big rich. We, I would, we have a CEO down. billionaire romance. Okay, here's, here's what I would also world. say. He's not just rich. He is a... He's good at being he's rich. He's good at being <laughs> rich. My he's, Tony. he's also politically savvy. Like, he knows how to navigate the politics of being rich. You know, he's also really good at saving young women on the verge of ruination. Yes, he, he looks like, good on horseback. Shut up. And he wears and wet. wet. <laughs> and wet. <laughs> and wet. Um, our uh, other examples are Zoe Washburn. Speaking of, um, speaking of Firefly. Temperance Brennan from Bones. Oh, uh, Geralt of Rivia and Worf. Yeah. Wolf. 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 Yes. So those were all our confident heroes. Highly skilled, kind of not really aware of or interested in the romance thing until it, it stumbled upon it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very competent. Yeah. yeah. He's good. certainly a confident hero. What we did when we were trying to limit the, well, because we were trying to figure out how to pick examples, we tried to limit it to people who had romantic interests that were clearly defined. <laughs> so we were like, yeah, no, uh, all these people would fall into this, but let's focus on the people who yeah. have partners. I mean, I still have hopes that the Mandalorian and Bo-Katan and the they a would whole make legion. Okay, of, well, just like, so we're oh clear, that is an awful pairing. Whatever, I mean, <laughs> you can live that life. The police pursuit geo suspense thriller, uh, which is what the Mandalorian is off of, essentially, like our narrative um, predicates there must be a competent main character. Like, that's the whole point of those shows, right? Take Art. Art and the born identity, whatever it is, usually that competency is extreme violence in the case of the suspense thriller genre, but that main character's defining trait is their competency. Um, and if they're going to have a growth arc, it's in realizing that that's not what they are entirely. Right? I think that that's what makes the Bones love interest so weird is that it's confident and confident together. No, it's hippo. Oh, yeah. I guess totally. it's, it's yeah. confident and hippo. It's the same thing with Castle. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's your true. time, I have a, a wrap-up question yes. for yeah. you in the last two minutes of this panel. Thank you. Uh, out of the tropes, which will you screw? Which one will you marry? Oh, fuck, marry kill. Okay. <laughs> Let's say send on a boat to somewhere else. <laughs> send on a boat to somewhere well, else. I'm an author. I could kill them if I wanted to. <laughs> yes. we, we recognize the sharpness of your pen. Uh, fuck. No. <laughs> fuck, fuck Himbo. Mary, um, Kindness, the what? What did you what did you call that one? Sensitive. Sensitive. Uh, sensitive that, or servant? Servant. Mary servant. Okay. Um, yeah. Sensitive is way too much work for me. And <laughs> uh, kill Byron. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, tortured. You're dead. I'm sorry. There's nothing about that that is interesting to me. Too much work. Um, I'm definitely also fucking hippo because, like, why wouldn't you? Um, <laughs> I don't think I could, I would choose multiples because why wouldn't I? But I would say in my life, I have also ended up with servant as well. You totally married him too. <laughs> I totally ended up with servant too. And who would you kill? Oh, so, no, no, torture. torture. No, I have yeah, no true. interest. 
Yeah, no, I would definitely send a tortured hero off on the long ship. On the boat. <laughs> to Venus or something. Uh, I'm also here for that himbo energy on a, you know, assignation with my ankles. Although competence, if competence, competency is in physical uh, sex work or whatever, then... I'll go with competent. No, sure. sure. <laughs> I'm so here for it. The competent here. I just, I'm like, yeah, that sounds good. I'll go with that. That flavor right there. Because that's the upside of competent heroes is that when they have decided to focus on you, you become an aspect of their competency. Yeah. And I'd like gonna... that tool belt to be at my service. I would argue that that's what Andrew is actually. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna, I was wondering which one you would pick for him. I would so. Lord FA is definitely, he's too confident. I actually think he's, like, if we talk about our love story, he's definitely not a servant hero. He is absolutely a confident hero. But he hero. became servant hero because that's his competency for yes. you. And yes. to compensate for your relationship. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to compensate for the so cost of dealing with the you. other half of this conversation? When does that happen? Oh, yeah. what a good question, Eve Riot Cryptid and Social Media Maven. Tomorrow we're talking about queer coded villains. Dun dun dun. And dun, so dun, you should join us. And this is a be fun. And that one's gonna be a little less structured. It's a lot more open questions and d d debate and discussion. And that's at four. Oh, in ballroom. Yeah. You're so good. Yeah. Thank you, Eve. Uh, Thank you. Uh, but we hope you've enjoyed us talking about heroes with you today, and we hope we've given you something to think about, and if you're writers out there, something to write about, and pick your favorite hero, or hero archetypes. And take him home with you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, please check out D&D &D Journey of the 5th Edition and Ragnarok and roll a Scion Hero to Ragnarok Story. Also, check out our Patreon page for more content and behind-the-scenes things, as well as joining us for a one-shot game or two.